Okay, so turn your Bibles with me to James chapter 3. And um, if you would like to have the notes and don't have them, go ahead and raise your hand. And the ushers will get them to you. James chapter 3. And uh, <clears throat> for those of you who are familiar with James chapter 3 are going, oh no. <laughs> like, oh man. Anyway, James chapter 3. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we, uh, we're grateful for who you are. Uh, Father, thank you for your presence in us. Thank you for your presence among us. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you would uh, release and increase, Father, the light of your spirit on our hearts, on our minds. Father, we ask you for the spirit of inspiration, Lord, under preaching of the word. Lord, that you would touch our hearts. Lord, you'd move us, Father, more and more towards you and your son in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, James chapter 3, as many of you know, we are on a 40-day um, a Daniel fast, just asking the Lord for uh, the lifting off the veil of the nation. This is a fast was called by Lou Engel and Andy Burt and our leadership team just uh, said, hey, let's jump in with these guys. And there's uh, over, you know, probably about five or 10,000 believers across the land that are participating in this fast um, asking the Lord for the release of the Spirit um, in the land. And it's a communion fast, and so they're also encouraging different ones just to take communion regularly and asking for the release of the blood of Jesus on the nation and the blood of Jesus on their own lives. And uh, as a leadership team, uh, a bunch of us uh, get together on Mondays and just kind of talk and share about the things that the Lord is highlighting. And uh, on our very first Monday, we just kind of opened up the floor, said, hey, does anyone have anything? And all of a sudden, the three of our ladies all had dreams independently of each other about the issue of speech. And we all went, oh, okay, got it. <laughs> and so when, uh, here we are. Now, when talking about the subject of speech, the thing that I would like to put before us is... Um, Yes, there are things that we need to change in terms of the way that we talk, the way that we carry our speech. But the thing that we, um, we want to keep in mind is that with the adjustment also comes an invitation from the Lord into something. And, um, and one, of the, uh, one of the longings of the Father's heart for his people is that we, is that we grow up, is that we mature. And... Um, and so part of what we're talking about today is how the issue of godly speech, how it is the final frontier of Christian, of, of Christian maturity. And so it's God's desire for us to, to grow up into all things. But it's also um, him giving us insight as to how we can steward the manifestation of God's presence in us. Uh, there's a lot of things that happens inside of us with regards to the experiencing of his presence who lives in us related to our speech. And then there's also a power dimension related to our speech, that through words, uh, we can speak words that move people's hearts to the Lord. We can speak words that move our hearts to the Lord. We can speak words that touch uh, people's bodies where they find healing. Uh, we can speak words that bring deliverance to uh, people's hearts and people's souls. And there are many, many examples in Scripture of how words spoken by a weak and broken people were anointed by the power of God. And so when the Lord is putting his finger um, on a community with regards to the issue of speech, it's not just merely saying, hey, you're doing this wrong, do this right. There, he's saying, no, there's more that I have for you. There's more insofar as the joy of Christian maturity. There's more that I have insofar as the stewardship, the experiencing of my grace in your heart. And there's more insofar as the realm of power 
that I want you to walk in as a people. And that, of course, goes for, uh, for the entire body of Christ as well. And so, so that's how I approach James 3. That's what I hear when I read James 3 is the Lord saying, hey, I have more for you if you would consider these things. Uh, secondly, in James 3, 8, um, James uh, uh, gives us somewhat discouraging news. He says, it's impossible to do this. <laughs> he says, it's impossible to tame the tongue. He says, the tongue, it's unruly. It, it will not be governed. Uh, it will, it, it's got a mind of its own. And so, but and in that, what we then hear is, therefore, there is the, the grace of God made available to us in order to walk out in these particular ways. And so part of our time this morning is going to be talking about some of the things that we can reach for, not just the things that we want to stay away from, but what are the things that we can reach for in the grace of God so we can grow in this um, glorious reality, really called uh, godly speech, because it truly is glorious. Now, uh, paragraph A, uh, one of the greatest joys of of being human is that we are created in the image of God. Now, we know that because of the fall, that, that as image bearers, we were broken. That image got distorted. And part of what the Lord has done and is doing through the gospel, through his son, is restoring us as image bearers. And that is essentially what Christian maturity is, is becoming more and more conformed into his image. And there's great joy in that. There's great joy in it because we get to interact with God's presence. Peter calls it partaking of his divine nature. God's very life becomes our life, his peace, this joy, this delight, they become ours. They become a part of our, um, our emotional fabric. And we get to experience the delights of his character being expressed through us. But not only his character, his purpose gets expressed through us. And his power gets expressed through us. And so when we're talking about Christian maturity, we're talking about Godliness, which really is joy. It's not just this um, modification of behavior, but no, it is truly an inward, inward uh, transformation, an inward change that happens because we are in union with God. And inasmuch as we interact with him and give ourselves to obeying his word, there's a transformative thing that begins to take place on the inside that releases the manifestation of God's joy. Joy is connected with the issue of bearing fruit. And by bearing fruit, again, it's the manifestation of God's character, God's power, and God's purpose. Now, where this thing is going for us as believers, and I don't mean this critically, but um, many actually don't think of it in this way. And part of it is because, you know, we're so in touch with our struggles. Sometimes there's our situations, they're, they're very, very overwhelming. That some of these and uh, <clears throat> that some of these exhortations they just seem out of reach, and yet Jesus puts before us the desire of the Father in Matthew five forty eight when he says, "Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect." In other words, you will be restored as image bearers, and you will reflect His character. You will reflect His purpose. You will reflect um, His power. And what's interesting is James, in James chapter 3, verse 2, he ties this issue of being made perfect. Instead of being made perfect, we could put being made mature. He connects it with the issue of speech. In James 3, 2, he says, For all we all stumble in many ways, but if there is, but if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to also bridle the whole body. I mean, that is an intense statement. Very intense statement. Now, what he's saying is that the person who, 
who doesn't speak any worthless or useless words, number one, is a person who is mature, number one, and number two, and is a person who's able to harness all of the passions that course through their body. There is a direct connection, I believe, between the passions that inflame our bodies, whether they be anger, lust, impatience, whatever these things are, there are our words often inflame those very things. They're deeply connected. Paragraph C, the, uh, the primary destiny of every believer is not our ministry assignment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But our ministry assignment, as important as it is, is not our primary destiny. Our primary destiny is a lifelong journey of inward transformation and the expressing of fruit according to the image of the Son of God. I'll say this again. Our primary destiny is a lifelong journey of inward transformation by the Holy Spirit and the expression of fruit that is according to the image of the Son of God. Expressing, in other words, expressing what Jesus is like. It'll come through all kinds of different ways because we have all kinds of different personalities, different backgrounds, different cultures, but the essence of it is that the, the character and the power and the purpose of Christ is the thing that comes, that, that is formed in us and it comes through us. It's a primary destiny. It is the way to experience joy. Now, the expression of that fruit is, again, which is his power, his purpose, his character, uh, where it manifests, firstly, it manifests in the context of our families. And so our destiny is to grow up into all things, for Christ to be formed in us, this inward transformation that comes from interacting with him and obeying his word, it, it expresses itself in the context of our homes. It expresses itself in the context of our friendships. It also expresses itself in the context of the marketplace. Now, the, the thing that's amazing about this, again, is that it's, it's actually not as mysterious as some would suppose. Yes, there are those moments where the Lord gives clear, a subjective guidance to an individual or a family or, or a group of people or, or, or a movement or organization and so forth, but we don't have to wait for those subjective uh, moments to know what the will of God for us is. We don't have to wait for that fruit to be formed in us and then to be expressed through us. Some examples of the will of God, according to the scripture, is, for instance, one that we participated in last week, you know, where we, at, at, uh, according to the measure of our faith and, and, and desire and whatever, uh, gave of our own resources to, uh, to the refugee crisis in, um, in Eastern Europe. And so giving is a manifestation of God's purpose coming forth. Uh, growing in purity uh, in our lives, that's the manifestation of God's uh, 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 purpose coming forth. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says, and this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you would not walk in passionate lust. And it tells us right there, in fact, an, an interesting exercise would be to go to the New Testament and find the verses that literally tell us what the will of God is. And, it, and it's actually quite surprising. The will of God is our purity, giving, serving, those around us, and again, we serve in all the spheres. We serve in the spheres of our family, our, 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 our friendships, the marketplace, the spiritual family that we're a part of. Whatever sphere that we're touching, that there's where we can express the purpose and the will of God. A prayer uh, operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit is part of the will of God. Um, every believer... Um, that names every person that names the name of Jesus, every believer, has the gifts of the Spirit. And I found that the gifts of the Spirit oftentimes just manifest in the context as we give ourselves to, uh, to serving those that are around us. The point being is that our primary destiny is not our ministry assignment, but it's for Christ to be formed in us and to be manifest. In Romans 8 to 29, 
Paul tells us that you and I were predestined to be conformed into the image of the Son. That is our, our primary, that's our primary destiny. Paragraph D, as humans, we are the only ones, this is amazing, we are the only ones in all of God's creation who are created in, the, uh, who are created in his image. We are the only ones who were created with the capacity for God to dwell in us and for Christ to be formed in us and for Christ to be expressed through us. And, and when I'm talking about the formation of Christ, I, I always refer to three things. In my mind, I mean three things. Number one, the, the formation and the manifestation or the expression of his character. Galatians chapter five calls it the fruit of the spirit. Then it is also the, uh, the forming and the manifestation of his purpose. And, there, and we can say there's two purposes. There are the, the, the clear biblical purposes of, of blessing our enemies, serving those that are around us, uh, prayer, giving, uh, uh, moving in the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, all these things are expressions of his purpose. Then, of course, there's a subjective purpose as well, and that, that where he gives that real clear sense of direction. And then the third one is the, the, uh, uh, the manifestation of his power, where, uh, where we can operate in power as we are operating um, in his purpose. Uh, the way that uh, I've heard Mike say it over the years, it's the manifestation of the, of the Lord's gifts, his fruits, and his wisdom. These are the three things that, uh, that are in my mind when I think about the forming of God as you and I are getting restored as image bearers. And then when we come into the fullness of that, that is what Christian maturity is. Ephesians 4 talks about you and I as believers growing up into all things that is the head. And so it's, which simply means that, that as Christ, the character of Christ, the purpose of Christ, the power of Christ is formed in us, that all the spheres that we touch are then impacted by, those, uh, 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 by, by that reality. Excuse me. Now we are divinely designed, paragraph D, we're divinely designed to, again, to reflect God's character, power, and purpose. And Jesus came to restore that image, and it's the Father's plan for us to pursue maturity in this life. That is part of the Father's desire. I've, uh, there was an old preacher, I went to be with the Lord some, uh, a few years ago named Peter Lord, and he used to say that, that he, says, uh, he, says a, he says that a father wants two, th uh, three things from his children, because one, that they would be in relationship with them in their latter years. He says, number two, that they would grow up and that the children would get along. He said, that is the thing that every parent wants. And I thought, you know what, that is really true about the Father as well. He wants us to be in relationship with him, number one. Number two, he wants us to grow up. And number two, he wants us to get along <laughs> with each other. And so when we're talking about Christian maturity, that is the thing that is in our mind. It's not some Tibetan, you know, go in the mountain and then cross your legs and then float. Over. We're not talking about that. We're talking about real practical ABCs as seen in the Scripture but it is formed in us. In other words, it comes out of us because of the transformative work of the grace of God that's taking place on the inside. Now, paragraph E, the, uh, uh, the uh, ministry assignments, which I mentioned earlier, they, whether they are in the context of our spiritual family or the marketplace, they are not our primary inheritance. Our assignments, however, what they do, they are for the purpose of bringing forth the inheritance of the father for his son, which is a mature bride who shares in his values and purposes and will rule and reign with him forever. That's the purpose of our ministry assignment. I'll say this again, our ministry assignment is not so much, that is not our destiny. It is the, the vehicle that the father has given to his church to, uh, to, uh, uh, for us to relate and interact with one another in such a way so that Christ Jesus would have his full inheritance. In fact, one of the uh, uh, interesting things about growing up is that as we grow up, one of the things that begins to happen, whether it is in a natural or in the spirit, and I think it happens the same way, is that we find ourselves be becoming concerned about the purposes and the destinies and the inheritance of those that are around us. 
It doesn't mean that we discard our own, but we begin to grow. We, we begin to have a concern. We, we, we begin to see that there's a greater purpose than entering into our inheritance. It is actually helping others get into their inheritance. Then you begin to find out that them entering into their inheritance actually ends up being yours as well. In fact, what is interesting in the scripture is that uh, there are at least two examples where the exaggerated focus on inheritance or the immaturity, which is what that is, costs a lot of problems. Uh, one example of that is in the case of Jacob, where he was, I mean, he was, I mean, he, I mean, he just was undercutting everybody, you know, to get to, <laughs> to, get to the inheritance. But in the other one is, uh, is, uh, uh, is the prodigal son. The, the issue with the prodigal son was he was so concerned about his inheritance, he was even willing to get it prematurely at the expense of his relationship with his father and those that are around him. In Ephesians chapter 4, a, f- a familiar passage, verse 11, where it talks about the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, that these ministries are designed to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for service. But here's why, verse 13, until the church becomes a perfect man or mature, the measure to the measure of the stature of the fullness that is in Christ. And so my point is, is the issue of maturity. Issue of maturity, that is the thing that's before us. And so when we're talking about the subject of godly speech, that's the grid, I believe, that we want to look at it, that it's part of the way that we grow into maturity to the point that where our speech so comes under the Lord's leadership and heaven says, that's a perfect man, that's a perfect woman. By perfect meaning, that's a mature woman or that's a mature man. That's a person in whom my character and my purpose and my power is being made manifest. So important was the subject of growing up to Paul that in Galatians 4.19, I have it right there in the notes, he says, my little children for whom I labor in birth again. He he goes, I'm starting all over again until Christ is formed in you. Paragraph F, the Father by the Spirit is in us laboring and contending for his great purpose. Every born-again believer, here this morning, the, uh, 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 by the indwelling spirit, the, the Father is at work. And it's kind of unsettling because he's never, he's not, there's nothing passive about him. And so even when we don't cooperate, he is working, and it's, it's a, a bit of a miserable existence, so we must just cooperate with him when he does. But he is, but he is, but he is always at work. He is, he's doing something on the inside, and what he's doing is, is he's, he's laboring to grant his son his inheritance. Beloved, one of my favorite verses, John 3, you know, we know John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, a few verses later, John 3, 34, it says, but God so loved his son that he gave him the world. The father has an inheritance for his son. And that inheritance is the, is, the, is, the, uh, is the kingdom of God being given to him, that he would rule and reign, but not only that, he would rule and reign it together with a bride who shares his values. Romans 8, 17, if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. This is absolutely amazing. Now, the reason why Paul, the uh, reason I'm bringing this up, because we'll look at the verse in just a moment, is that understanding that there is the inheritance that the father has for his son. Yes, we all have our little inheritance here and there, you know, but, but beloved, there's a bigger picture. That the father has an inheritance for his son. And I believe that this is, understanding this is key to overcoming the spirit of complaint, which is often rooted in not getting our way. That in places when we're not getting our way, let's even say we're supposed to get our way and we don't. The Lord says there is something bigger than getting your way. 
It says, I'm at work in you to give my son what's his. And that's an inheritance. And guess what? And you are included in that inheritance. A kingdom that he will rule and reign forever, and he will rule that kingdom with his bride, of which you are a part of. And so Paul, oftentimes, he connects the church with something greater than getting our way, which is, again, the Father's inheritance. In Philippians chapter 2, here's what Paul says. He says, um, work out your salvation. Because, he says, because the Father is at work in you to will and to do. In other words, the Father is at work in you to bring forth his purpose. Remember we mentioned earlier that a being in the image of God, reflecting who God is, reflecting his, 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 uh, his character, um, his, his power, and his purpose. And here Paul is saying is that, that when we became born again, as the Holy Spirit took residence inside of us, one of the things the Father began to do, he began to work inside of us by the Spirit to bring forth his way, to bring forth his purpose. Beloved, this is massive. I really believe that this is the key to joy. We're living in a time in the 21st century where probably the greatest amount of emotional uh, uh, illnesses exist in people's hearts and minds. And, 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 and at the same time, it's probably the greatest time when there's more talk about the expression of self than the expression of Christ. And I think they're deeply connected. Now, and now, now that said, I want to give a little qualifier. I understand that there are people are, who are in very difficult situations, and there's challenges that come with that, and there's all kinds of ways that uh, those people can need help, and, it, and sometimes it takes decades. I'm not talking about those exceptions. I'm talking about... The average folk wrestle with more emotional ailments because we are more consumed with the expression of self rather than the expression of Christ. And so we're at odds, we're, we're, we're butting heads with the Father, according to Philippians 2, who is at work in us to both do and will his purposes. And so Paul is saying, look, he says, Church of Philippi, he says, um, there's, a, there's, there's a greater purpose at work here. God is at work in you to do his good pleasure. In other words, if you actually yield to him, to that work, and again, the, 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 the work is, it really is that list, and it's a bunch of things. It's, for me, it simply means the Lord knocking on my heart goes, Stuart, hey, adjust your finances a little bit more so you can give more. I'm like, okay, it's, that, that's what I mean by his work. It's, hey, Stuart, that, that little attitude you had there, he goes, yeah, he goes, let's skip that. He goes, okay, next week it'll show up again, we'll, but just keep working on it. Okay, good, I got it. He goes, so Stuart, he goes, that, that way you said that thing? I go, yeah. He goes, mm, mm He goes, let's go that way. I'm like, oh, okay, good, got it. He goes, and uh, he goes, hey, you, you got some gifts you're sitting on, you're not really using them. I'm like, well, you know, I'm not really feeling led. He goes, no, no, let's forget all that. He goes, get into the way, start serving people, and it will begin to manifest. That's what I mean by his will coming forth through us. And again, there are these subjective things that come with that as well, but we're talking just really just about the main and plain that we see within the word of God. But here's what Paul said that I think is so amazing. He says that he's both to will and to do for his good pleasure. In other words, when we give ourselves to those things, there is a surprising thing that happens on the inside. We begin to experience his delights. We actually begin to experience uh, 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 the, the pleasures of God in our hearts, and joy becomes a part of our experience with the Lord. But then Paul continues in verse 14. He says, okay, here's the deal. He goes, I want you to work it out. You go, okay, got it. He goes, what do you want to work out? He goes, well, I want you to work out the, because the Father is at work doing something in the inside. You go, okay, good, I got it. He goes, so now how do we work it out? Paul goes, you sure you want to know? He goes, yeah, bring it on. I mean, I'm feeling it today. Okay, here it goes. Verse 14, do all things without complaining and disputing. It's like, oh, I was looking more for the, you know, the 10 charismatic ways of how to find the will of God for your life. I'm looking for that. You know, visit the prophet, you know, confirm the prophet, then go to the third prophet to get that prophet to tell what the other prophet said. 
You know, get up. You know, I was I was looking for that. I was looking for don't complain. It's like ah, who wants to do that? I like complaining. You know, the other day, you know, the other day, <laughs> you know, the other day, I was with a group of us and we're talking about the issue of complaining. And then one person goes, "So why do we complain?" I said, "I know why I complain because it feels good. I mean, it's just that simple." Okay, see. <laughs> Uh, you know, I said, it's, that, it's that, that pressure that's on my soul and, and, and whatever poor soul that's near me gets it. And the thing is, I'm just, I'm just enough of a communicator to make it sound insightful. Uh, but, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, but, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, okay. All righty. <laughs> you know where this is going, right? All right. But the, but the point is, is that the way that we work out our salvation is by actually resisting the spirit of complaint, which is rooted in not getting our way. We just overcome positively by understanding that there is a bigger thing going on. And guess what? God is going to get his way. So we might as well, we might as well kind of jump on the program with him and begin to experience his delights because that is our inheritance. That is our destiny as image bearers. Go over to page two. I won't go through all of page two. I just want to highlight a couple of points there. The godly speech as the, in a, as the final frontier. That what we find in James 3, we find three components. Uh, James is highlighting the, the speech life of the messenger or the teaching ministry. The second thing is the inner life of the messenger. And then thirdly, the, the, uh, the result or the fruit of the teaching ministry. And these are the three reasons why um, those who are in the teaching ministry, and by teaching ministry, I don't just mean from the platform. I mean uh, one-on-one discipleship, small group discussion, friendship groups, some of you have got Bible studies within the context of the marketplace. All these, uh, some of you have, are, are leading studies in college campuses, high schools. These are all examples of, of, of the teaching ministry. And Paul says that, that um, excuse me, James says that the, 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 the speech life of that teacher is critical, but the speech life of that, of that messenger is connected to their inner life. And both of those things together ensure that the fruit of our communication is righteousness to those that are hearing us. Paragraph B, I won't go into all of it, you can read it for yourself, but the the thing there that that I'm highlighting is that uh, one of the reasons why the inner life of the teacher and then connected with their speech is so important is because it will ensure that they don't become false messengers with false doctrines. Because oftentimes false messengers or false doctrines exist because the messenger has bought into their own press and it, and it got all mixed up with the bitterness and the jealousy and the ambition that verse 13 talks about. So James makes a remarkable claim, however, in, verse, in paragraph C, he makes a very powerful claim. Again, we mentioned it earlier, that those who harness their speech have reached the place of Christian maturity and are able to harness the passions of their body. In my opinion, paragraph D, there's nothing that accelerates our maturation process faster than yielding our speech to Jesus' leadership. It's almost like our mouth is like a door that keeps the fire on the inside burning. And the longer that we keep that door closed, the more that fire burns and begins to do its transformative work. The Lord, in his perfect wisdom, so positioned the tongue. I love how James says it in 3.6. He says, the, the tongue is so set among its members that it defiles the whole body. And we can say that the opposite as well. The tongue is so set among its members that it's able to release the life-giving flow of God in our hearts. It's It's amazing. The God, it was his perfect wisdom. He so positioned the tongue that its very operation will either set us on a course of defilement or it says on a course, on a journey of experiencing the wellspring of life in our hearts. 
I'm gonna say this again. God has so in his brilliance located our tongue that it will either set us on the course of defilement in our bodies or it will set us on the joy of experiencing the wellspring of life. There are surprising experiences that await us on the inside as we continue to yield our speech to the Lord's leadership. So how do I define godly speech? Godly speech can be, in my opinion, can be best summarized as speech that is informed by the divine narrative. It is speech that is informed by the divine narrative. This divine narrative includes the narrative about our enemies. It includes the narrative about society, our coworkers, church family, our natural family, even ourselves. That all that is included in the divine narrative. You know, it's all about the issue of society. You know, the subject of, of, of speech is, is tough because, because everything around us right now is saying, say more, 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 say more. And don't, don't just say more. Say however you want to say it, however you feel to say it. And just be sure that you are right because if you're right, then you have the right to say it however you want. And uh, beloved, it's not so in the kingdom of God. I remember in 2012, I think it was, it was around the election season. It was my night off. I was on a night watch that night uh, uh, during that season. And uh, I just on my night off and just kind of sitting, thinking, whatever. All of a sudden, this phrase comes to me, silent night, holy night. And, uh, I, and I understood right then and there that, that there was an invitation being given to the night watch in that particular season to take 50 days of suspending all political conversations, just suspend them for 50 days and just really just focus on the Lord for those 50 days in the prayer room. And I remember thinking, go, I said, Lord, suspending, talking about politics? I said, Lord, we're Americans. I goes, what about our rights? <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, we're Americans. What about our freedom of speech? And he says, yes, but what about your right to remain silent? And I was like, yeah, I, I remember that one. That, that amendment is there too, right? I remember it. Okay, good, I got it. <laughs> we we want to take our cues as it pertains to our speech uh, from, the, from the word of God. Again, uh, this divine narrative, it includes Jesus' perspective and, the, and, and his lens over our lives, those around us, again, our enemies, the spiritual family that we're a part of, the society in which we live. He has a perspective, and this perspective comes through his sovereign working, the, uh, the, the vastness of his love, uh, understanding the frame of the people that are involved. Uh, one of my, uh, one of, a prayer that I like to pray comes out of Psalm 103, 13 to 14, where he says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion uh, 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 for those who fear him, for he, I love this, for he knows our frame. One translation says our constitution. He, he, he knows our makeup. He knows how we're built and how we are wired. And so paragraph F, we want to regularly therefore ask the Lord what he's thinking and feeling about people's and circumstances around us. And the, and the, and the prayer that I like to pray at times is, Lord, would you, would you give me insight into their frame? Because, because I know that you relate with them in a certain way concerning their frame. Would you give me that insight? Because I want to relate with them the way that you relate with them. Page three, godly speech, connecting with the divine narrative. Let's go over to in a paragraph B. That you and I are made and created to participate in the Trinitarian dialogue. And as many of you know, over the last nearly a year, uh, we've been teaching a course on uh, John 13 to 17, just looking at the, the interaction between the Father and the Son and the many dynamics that come with that and our invitation as believers to, to, to through the word, engage in that dialogue. Beloved, our mouth, our tongue is designed to speak and articulate holy things. We are to speak beautiful things about who God is 
speak beautiful things about others, the world around us. And again, when it comes to the subject of speech, we're not just talking about the issue of restraint, but we're talking about the transformative inward encounters by the Holy Spirit, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As James tells us, he says, you know what? The tongue is unruly. It it can't be tamed. And it's true. But then it also says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so the, the narrative, the life flow, the activity that is taking place inside of our hearts, and that gets changed just by simply interacting with the Lord, connecting with his word. Let's have the worship team come up. So I'm going to end with this. <clears throat> Paragraph D. We want to be a people that, um, that when we speak, about our adversaries, when we speak about world events, we speak about society, our friends, family, even ourselves, that when we speak, it connects the hearts of the hearers with the agenda around God's throne, God's purpose, God's plan. Here are a couple of things that we can do, and there's many more, but here's just a couple of things. Number one, is engaged in a Trinitarian dialogue. Just simply coming before the Lord and interacting with him regularly. Isaiah chapter six, the coal that touched Isaiah's lips came from the altar, which is the place of prayer. And so as we give ourselves to the place of prayer, that's where our hearts change and that's where our speech gets adjusted. Secondly, follow the biblical process of dealing with our adversaries and complaints. Matthew 5, 42 and 48. Jesus just lays it out right there. He goes, bless, forgive, serve, do well. He just gives us a whole list of things that we can do in terms of how to respond to our adversaries and to respond to complaints. Lastly, praying and prophesying over one another. Uh, One of the reasons why the prophetic ministry was given um, wasn't firstly so we can get a dot com and get the show on the road. It was given to actually build the very spiritual family that we're part of. That if, uh, that if Isaac over there uh, gives me a prophetic word, which is done on many occasions, it builds me up. But in doing that, it's actually building the body and vice versa and others. And so the way that we build the body, one of the ways is through the prophetic ministry by prophesying over one another, edification, exhortation, comfort. And uh, Kirk Bennett over there, he and um, he's leading the charge of that, just really helping um, our spiritual family get stirred up and just prophesying over one another uh, uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So pray and prophesy over one another, and then also uh, participating in the ministry line. And again, if you're interested in doing that, uh, Kirk is leading the charge of that as well. But also just some real simple things we can do, just our interaction with the Lord through the word, uh, committing to go through the biblical process of how we deal with our adversaries um, and the issues of complaint. And then thirdly, just pray for one another. And just, you know, you're about to go to that conversation and say, Lord, what are you thinking and feeling? And here's what I found. I found one or two things will happen. Either I will get an impression or I will get nothing, and here's what I mean. And when I get nothing, it, is, it just happens. You're, you're talking to someone and they go, man, funny you should say that. That really, man, that really touches me. And it just, it just came right out. And so the reason I'm saying that part is because when we're saying, Lord, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? Don't, we don't have to wait for something epic to necessarily happen. He holds our hearts in his hands and he will turn them in as, he, as he pleases. And yes, there are those times where you might hear or see something, but just those simple little phrases I have found, Lord, what do you think or what are you feeling? Just on the way to the conversation, it really changes the conversation. It, it's actually quite amazing. And so we want to engage with the Lord. We want to engage in the biblical process of how to deal with the adversaries and our complaints. And uh, we want to pray and prophesy over one another. Amen. I invite you to stand. Father, we we thank you, Lord, for your word. Father, thank you that you uh, are so committed to inviting us and calling us into your likeness and the likeness of your son. 
But Father, I ask, Lord, that you would, that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart will be pleasing in your sight, oh God. Father, I ask you, Lord, that you would strengthen us in the inner man. Lord, as we say yes to do the biblical process of how to deal with difficult situations. Father, I ask you that you would stir up prophecy in our hearts to exhort, to encourage, to comfort. Father, I ask you that you would open up our eyes to your word. Lord, as we engage in conversation with you and your son and your spirit, release an increased revelation. Father, even just from this day forward, Lord, as we read your word, Lord, I pray, Lord, for the kisses of your word, Father, to touch our hearts. We say yes to you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 